President Collins is the 14th president of the Boston Fed. And importantly, she was born in Scotland, raised in New York City, but was Boston bound. And I'll get to that in a little bit. So prior to her role at the Boston Fed, and actually just a year ago last year, many of you probably remember the announcement when she was appointed to be the Fed head here. Um, sure, she has been here only for a year. And she's been the dean. And also she's been a provost at University of Michigan. She's been at the Brookings Institute, IMF, Georgetown professor, and served 10 years as a director for the Chicago Fed. But most importantly, during, during her formative years, that's 16 years here in the Boston area, whether she was a student at Harvard or whether she received her PhD, in particular at MIT, or actually became a professor at Harvard itself. These were the years in which that her research and scholarship was forged. So to us, we think of her as being here for a very long time. One year ago, a month, her intellectual curiosity brought her back to Boston. And as a result, Boston community in particular in this club is better for it. So without further ado, on behalf of the Boston Economic Club, I'd like to give you a warm welcome. Mark, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. And I am absolutely thrilled to be here with all of you today, both of those of you who are in the room, and I know we have some folks who are watching remotely, uh, and also to be here back in Boston. And I, I'll, I'll be really brief. I do want to just make a, a few remarks, introduce um, our distinguished guests, and get as quickly as we can to I know what we're all looking for, which is what will be a really engaged uh, discussion. Um, it, it really does mean a lot to us here at the Fed to have the club back here. Uh, and so we're all just delighted to see everyone. I have to say, when I walked into the room, the buzz was just palpable and uh, delighted to be able to, to welcome everybody back. Um, of course, um, seven months in, uh, so the announcement was almost exactly a year ago, a year ago tomorrow, but I started July 1. And so um, I'm also delighted that this is the first uh, event that I'm able to attend, and I look forward to, to certainly to many more. Um, you know, we, we really uh, kind of resonate with the club's ongoing interests, which is really just a frank exchange of views on important topics, leveraging rigorous data analysis, and, and thinking about ways to have an impact and really kind of further a shared mission. And so we uh, very much support that and uh, look forward to continued partnerships. It fits squarely in the Boston Fed and the Federal Reserve's mission and focus, which is really policies and services to uh, you know, foster a vibrant, inclusive economy that works for all. And that's something we're all hard at work on. I suspect some of the pieces of that will come up in our, in our conversation today. Um, it is absolutely true that I'm also delighted to be back here in Boston. I did spend 16 years here. It's a bit of a homecoming for me, and it's wonderful to see the vibrancy and also the fabulous talent in so many different areas and commitment to really um, leveraging opportunities and making this an even better place than it already is. So just delighted to, to be back. Um, now it's just my pleasure to say some brief words of introduction for Neil Kashkari and Roger Owenstein. Now I know that you are each able to um, access the bios, and so I'm going to be brief again to get us to the discussion. Um, and I'm not going to repeat that, but I do want to just give a few highlights. So Roger, as I suspect you all know, has a very distinguished record as a reporter, author, exploring nuances of the economy and the financial system, and the latest of his seven books was recently named a finalist for the Lincoln Prize. So uh, just delighted to have you here as part of the conversation. And turning to Neil, uh, again, a very distinguished, varied career before joining the Minneapolis Fed as president in uh, 2016. And while he's been really proactive and creative there, and I'll just highlight the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute and a number of other initiatives too numerous to mention, um, it, it's been wonderful to have him as a colleague more broadly. Uh, I really appreciate the extent to which, like all of my FOMC colleagues, he really values public service, public opportunities, and well-being for our economy and for all of the people who participate in it and finding ways to, to broaden and spread that out. 
Um, actually, some similarities between Neil and Roger. And uh, they're both incredibly productive, thoughtful, active, engaged thinkers. They're also willing to provide candid insights and opinions. And whether or not you agree on all fronts, uh, they foster substantive, engaged dialogue that we can all learn from on topics that matter. And so I want to commend both of them for that. As a lifelong student, researcher, and educator myself, I, I really appreciate uh, kind of willingness to engage actively, to analyze, and then to offer views and opinions in a way that uh, uh, engages with others. Um, so I'll conclude my remarks by, again, just a very warm welcome to Neil, to Roger, to all of you who are here in the room, to everyone watching online. And uh, just to say again how absolutely thrilled we are to have the Economic Club event back in our space. And with that, I'm sure that we are in for a very lively, active conversation. And with no further ado, I turn it over to Neil and Roger. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me, first of all. I'm just going to say a few thank yous. I'm going to turn it over to Roger to kick off our discussion. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, so I'm president of Minneapolis Fed, but maybe more relevant for this today is I'm on the board of directors of the Economic Club of Minnesota. And I think these economic clubs uh, provide really valuable service, bringing in experts from around the country, or around the world, to talk about important issues in a non-political manner. So I was honored to get your invitation, Mark. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Thank you to Susan and my colleagues at the Boston Fed for hosting us. And of course, thank you to Roger. I'm a huge fan. And so when this opportunity came up, I actually want to interview him. So I'm hoping that we can have a little bit of back and forth uh, as we go forward. But I really appreciate you being here, Roger. And thank you all uh, for being here as well. Uh, Neil, it's a pleasure. Uh, Susan, thank you very much for that uh, lovely, gracious, uh, generous introduction. Thank you to Mark at the, at the uh, Economic Club. Does it sound okay? I, I just, no? You might need to move it up a little higher. Move this one up higher. This one up higher? There you go. How's that? How's that now? Any better? The green light is on. Okay, that, there, there we go. Okay. I want to say what uh, an honor it is for me, for me to be at the Fed. It means an awful lot as an institution, uh, uh, partly, I guess, because one of my books is about the Fed. It was formed, as uh, some of you may know, the, the inspiring uh, intellectual author of it was an immigrant named uh, Paul Warburg, who had a dream, and we're in the presence today of uh, two uh, Federal Reserve uh, Bank uh, presidents. Uh, one of them is an immigrant uh, from Scotland. One is the child of uh, immigrants uh, uh, from India. So I think um, they are carrying on the tradition uh, that, that Warburg said uh, he hoped would be carried on, that the Fed would be, uh, he said, like the churches of old Europe, uh, a great institution uh, in the United States. Uh, Neil, I don't have to ask you what you've been up to lately. Uh, we all saw the bad news last week. Rates went up uh, by a, another uh, 25 bits. Um, what's next? I think, I think that's the question uh, asked itself. And, 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 and you've even partly answered it because you've, you've uh, hinted uh, at a very precise number, 5.4%. Uh, and I, I, I wondered, like, is that, you know, I know there are 10 commandments and certain numbers come down from, but, but, but where does 5.4 come from? Yeah. Um, we're, at four, we're, by the way, in a range now of 4.5 to, to 4.75. Correct. Yeah. So once every three months, each FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee participant, needs to submit essentially a forecast of what we think optimal monetary policy will be and how the economy will respond. And it's a tough thing. Once every three months, we have to write something down. Uh, and we have a lot, I'm sure Susan does this with her colleagues, a lot of deliberation with my economists at the Minneapolis Fed on what do we think the underlying trends are for inflation? How responsive do we think the economy is going to be to our rate hikes? How long does monetary policy take to work its way through the economy? So there's a lot of judgment and art in addition to attempts at science to try to put down something. And basically, last year, I concluded, and I think many of my colleagues concluded, that the traditional economic models that we rely on to understand inflationary dynamics have really failed in the reopening of the economy. 
They, we did not see, just to be blunt, we did not see the giant inflation coming and we did not expect it to last as long as it did. As you might recall, many of us said we thought it would be transitory. Well, what we ended up having is not, does not feel like transitory. So once I concluded that, hey, these models are not working, then how do we, we still have to make decisions. How do you make decisions if your fundamental tool is not working? Well, we have to let the inflation guide us. And it's raising rates aggressively to try to get real interest rates positive. It's, it's unlikely that negative real interest rates would be uh, res uh, restraining the economy. So we need to get real positive interest rates across the yield curve, get there as fast as we can, uh, and then watch inflation and see how inflation responds. And so far, uh, headline inflation has come down because oil and food prices in many cases have come down. Core inflation has come down because goods prices have fallen. But the services side of the economy is still hot. And we know housing inflation is a big part of that, but we can actually analyze and forecast housing pretty well. If you look at new leases that get signed, it takes a year or two for them to work their way through the, the official inflation statistics. So if you strip out housing, you're left with this part of the economy called core services X housing. Think about the services economy, the wages that people are paying and people are earning. We haven't seen any movement there. And so there's some hopeful signs, but there's not yet much evidence in my judgment that the rate hikes that we've done so far are having much effect on the labor market. And we need to bring the labor market into balance. So that tells me we need to do more. How much more? I don't know for sure. So you stress two things <clears throat> you're looking at. One is inflation itself by, by whichever or, or, or various measures, core, the headline number and so on, but how much are prices going up? And that's, I mean, that's the object, right? Correct. That's, that's, that's why you guys are, and men and women are, are raising rates now because inflation is too high. But you're not just looking at inflation. You're also looking at the labor market, which is, which is you know, and, and, and uh, you know, Larry Summers has been, has been a spoof for saying Larry Summers wants to destroy a million jobs or something. But obviously, neither he nor, nor those of you who are on the Fed, your goal isn't to, to destroy jobs. But, but which of those two are you really, which will be dispositive? Is it going to take lower inflation or is it going to take, you know, we had a huge jobs number of 517,000. Is it going to take lower than 200, lower than 100? What, when does the bell ring so that at least, at least Neil Kashkari can say, okay, we've got this under control? Well, um, one, there's a bridge, you could think, between jobs and inflation. And one of those bridges, a pit stop on that bridge is wages. So what's happening to wage growth? You would think if wages are climbing fast and wages are a big part of the services economy, if wages are climbing really fast, then that probably means inflation is going to stay high. So typically, the way we think this works if we have a 2% inflation target, and prior to the pandemic, we were running at about 1% productivity growth, you could think wage growth of 3% is consistent with inflation at 2%, assuming productivity is unchanged. Well, right now, depending on your measure, wage growth is somewhere between 4 and 5%. So wage growth right now is too hot to support a 2% inflation environment. So nobody at the Fed wants to destroy jobs. We want, one of our goals is maximum employment. We want as many Americans as possible gainfully employed and enjoying higher wages. But we want that environment to be sustainable. We want it to be a, a healthy job market consistent with 2% inflation. So that to me says we need to get wage growth around 3%. Mm -hmm. And what's tough is we saw this job report that came out on Friday, 500,000 jobs. Big surprise to all of us that it was so high. Now it's one reading. Sometimes things are hot, sometimes they're cold. Don't overreact to one reading. But it's hard to imagine a real moderation in wages if the economy is creating jobs at anywhere close to that level. So this is the old good news is bad news. Uh, a lot of jobs, but, but it's, it's, it's got this bad news, you know, non-silver lining. W would you be willing, uh, you and your colleagues, to take actions that, on interest rates that could tip the economy into recession um, if, if you felt those actions were necessary uh, to stop inflation. And, and for the lay people here, in a sense, we're all lay people. You know, we're all people our ordinary lives. Why, why is that a good trade to make? Sure. If you go back in history, um, not all the way back to your book, but we're going to get there. <laughs> if you go back in more recent history, one of the big errors that the Federal Reserve made was in the late 1960s and 1970s in letting inflation get out of control. 
And some of you will remember a time when you had double digit mortgage rates, uh, double digit interest rates, and inflation was the number one economic issue on the minds of the American people because there was no way to escape it. Ultimately, it took a new Fed chairman, Paul Volcker coming in and with his colleagues, raising rates dramatically to crush inflation and to anchor inflation expectations. Now, in doing so, he ended up causing, they caused a very deep recession, a very deep recession to, uh, that was necessary. But that then set us up for 30 plus years a very positive economic environment, muted inflation, decent growth, mild recessions that ended up following. And so I think most of my colleagues agree with me that ha keeping inflation expectations anchored at 2% is absolutely foundational to achieving the thriving economic environment that we all hope for and that we all can achieve. But you must first build the foundation. And that foundation is anchored inflation expectations that the Volcker Fed managed to achieve. So we do not want to cause a recession, but we know we have a job to do to get inflation back down to 2% and to keep inflation expectations anchored. I don't think we're going to have to do anywhere near what the Volcker Fed had to do because we entered this period with inflation expectations. You don't anchored. see a 19% federal funds rate. No, I do not see right. that. That's uh, good news. We can make news there. I'm, news. I'm, That's I'm right. saying That's right. no. But, but, but has, has the horse left the barn on uh, not letting it get out of control. Does anyone really believe that inflation is going to go back to 2% or, or as it was for much of the 21st century up to the pandemic, the Fed had to work hard to get it up to 2%. Is, do you see us going back there or has, this, has these last some years, which are still going on, you know, sort of change the psychology where it's going to be back to 3, 3.5% 3 is normal, sometimes 4, sometimes 2 and 3 quarters or uh, or that the great moderation is the name correct for the period of of extremely low and stable rates um is that history i don't think so i don't see any reason to think that it would be history uh i'll say a couple things first of all if you look at financial market indicators financial markets and the bond market and inflation expectations that you can pull out of the bond market are showing great confidence actually more confidence than we have that inflation is going to fall very quickly back down to our 2% target over the course of this year and, and some into next year. Uh, I hope they're right, but at least financial markets are saying no, but the scenario you painted is not correct. And then if you look at what were, what were the- Did you buy a long-term bond? Uh, we're not allowed to buy uh, individual <laughs> securities. So um, I invest only in index funds, widely distributed. You can see my financial disclosures for all the information. We'll, we'll um, take it on faith. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the dominant macroeconomic trends leading up to the pandemic were things like the aging of our society, a lot of savings, rather low investment, leading to low neutral interest rates. You know, the, the central bank is not actually independently setting interest rates. We are responding to these macroeconomic forces, and there's some interest rate that represents neutral. We don't set where neutral is. The macro economy does. The demographics of society, savings, investment, et cetera. And we are adjusting interest rates around that neutral. I have not seen anything that suggests to me that we're in a fundamentally new world going forward. If anything, the demographics have gotten worse. Societies continue to age. People have retired early. Immigration has uh, really took a dip as a result of the pandemic. All of these things have effects on the economic environment. So the, the savings world. glut, the things that Bernanke used to worry about, when he, that could come back. It could, absolutely could and, come and, back. And force rates down. And it, it's certainly possible. I, I've not seen anyone make a strong case why that will not be the case that we, where we return to once we get through this transition period. What about the missing worker and the, and the, and the pressure on wages? Well, that's a, that's a serious issue. I mean, a lot of people retired early because of the pandemic. Don't forget, more than a million Americans died from COVID. Uh, and and each one is a human tragedy. It's also a lot, a lot of lost potential output for the economy. Uh, then we have dried up immigration uh, as well. And it's all having an effect on our economy's potential. But that to me doesn't affect how I think about inflation. It just affects how big the economy will be. And I would like it to be bigger, us being able to produce more goods and services. But we need more workers to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a little bit more in the future. And then I want to get to what led to this point if if we could go back, and you're you're hopeful, I won't say confident, but that we can get back to two percent, um, 
would that imply a, you, know, you talked about real rates have to be, real rates have to be positive, a 5% Fed funds rate or something? I mean, if we, so. Well, there's, a, there's the transition period that we're going through right now, right. which is where most of my colleagues, I think, have said they expect the federal funds rate to get above 5% at some point this year. Could it go higher than that? Certainly possible it could go higher than that. We will all respond to the data that we see in the inflation. Uh, and then the expectation is at some point, we will end up holding rates, pausing for some period of time, probably a long period of time, while that tightened policy works its way through the economy, and then assess, do we need to go higher from there, or do we need to go lower from there? Uh, and it's going, to, it's going to be determined by how quickly inflation starts falling back towards our target. So, you know, the one thing I'll say to you, we have a lot of different views around the FOMC, a lot of different backgrounds, but we are all totally united in our commitment to getting inflation back down to our 2% target. And we have a range of views on what it's going to take to get there, but the commitment does not deviate around the committee. Are, are, do you lean on the, the hawkish side, the more worried side, the, the, the less convinced side that, that the job has been done? That's I, it. Yeah, Body but, English. That, that, correct. Yeah. Yes. So I'm, uh, if you just look at our individual rate forecasts, I'm on the hawkish end of things um, just because it seems like underlying inflation, the job market, mm -hmm. wage growth is quite robust right now. Would, would you say it's important if you have two risks, one is um, obviously the risk that Fed actions could, could cause a, a recession, a new problem. But the other risk is that the problem we already have, inflation, isn't cured, that the first responsibility is to cure the problem we already have. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is you absolutely- You don't want to be back here three years later saying we didn't really beat inflation, which happened in the 70s. This is exactly right. And that's, we are acutely aware of the mistakes that were made in the 1970s when they thought, the committee thought they'd done it, they backed off, and then inflation got more entrenched, flared back up again, and then they had to go even higher to ultimately bring it back down. That's a mistake we cannot make. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the mistakes, not in the 70s, but, but, but in the recent period. Uh, what happened to the Fed? Why were those signals missed? Some, some prominent economists got them. Obviously, plenty of prominent economists were wrong, and, and those same economists who were right this time may have been wrong some other time. So, you know, that's, that's a, a hindsight bias. But, but uh, still... You guys are sitting in the chairs. Um, why did the Fed miss it, particularly when, uh, when prices were moving up, you know, month after month after month? So, if, you know, we always talk about our dual mandate, stable prices and maximum employment. And in, prior to the pandemic, we learned that the unemployment rate could get as low as 3.5% and not trigger high inflation. That's what we saw right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, in May of 2021, core inflation first crossed the 2% mark. And at that moment, the unemployment rate was 5.9%. So we see a little bit of inflation. Okay, we're mm -hmm. crossing 2%. But boy, there's still millions of available workers on the sidelines that represent a lot of output, potential output. Well, should we be raising rates at that point? When there's still so many workers out there waiting to find work. Right then was zero. Right then, yes, we were still at zero, yes, correct. Yes. And basically, we took about six months from that moment that we finally crossed 2% before we said to by November of 2021, okay, we need to do something different. We need to accelerate our plans. And that's when we started signaling to the markets that tightening is coming. And you saw a response in financial markets. They started adjusting then. So, I, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I absolutely wish we had started tightening sooner. But knowing what we knew at the time, I actually think the call that we made was eminently reasonable based on the facts that were in front of us. And then we took about six months to say, okay, the models are not working. We need to get moving. So we, we spoke at lunch a little bit about the, the toolkit the Fed used in 2008. In 2008, you know, lowered rates to zero, uh, bought up all kinds of credit, didn't have, have before, hadn't bought before, built up the balance sheet, kept rates low, and, um, and it worked because even if the economy didn't recover quickly, it recovered despite the, these uh, forecasts of, of um, runaway inflation that were all over the press, those advertisements you remember being taken out, uh, none of that happened because basically the American household was building slowly, slowly, slowly rebuilding its personal balance sheet and they weren't spending and there was no inflation. Um, was that same uh, set of tools used to a different situation this time? Because this time it wasn't a mortgage crisis, it was a virus. And once we had the virus, you know, under control, the economy was ready to roll. Did you, did you apply those proper lessons for 2008 uh, to the world war this time? 
a, a very good question. I would say we fought two distinct wars in COVID. The first war was in March of 2020 when the virus first hit and uh, governments were shutting down, sending stay at home orders, et cetera. And as you, I'm not sure if you even remember this, a lot of people won't remember it. The financial markets were on the precipice of complete collapse. So in 08, what's interesting is in 08, when investors got scared, they fled to treasury bonds as a place of safety. In 2020, when the pandemic hit, the pandemic was so unlike any of us have lived through anything like this, that people just wanted cash. They didn't even want treasury bonds. So they fled treasury bonds too. And then you had the fundamental plumbing of our financial system on the verge of collapse. You know, so in my district, we have a lot of big companies, including big food companies, like General Mills, you know, Cheerios. So General Mills and companies like that did really well because the supermarket stayed open, people couldn't go to restaurants, so they went to grocery stores. But if companies like General Mills, whose business was sound, could not access the financial markets because the markets were collapsing, then this virus, which has infected people and targeted the services economy, spreads over to the entire economy, including the goods economy. And so in March of 2020, under Chair, leader, Chair, uh, Chair Powell's leadership, the Fed acted very aggressively to go in to stabilize financial markets and to keep the plumbing of the financial system working. So in that case, we applied the lessons of 08 even more powerfully and effectively to get the financial system. And you're, you're the suggesting way. appropriately. Appropriately. Now, once we get through that acute period, now we've still got very high unemployment, great uncertainty about what the fiscal response is going to be. The best health experts in the world were saying, we don't know if a vaccine is even possible and how many years it's going to take. How long is this virus going to be with us? And then we moved into, we need to provide as much economic support to get the economy going again, not just the acute uh, financial stability situation that we had in March 2020. I think there we could have a debate mm -hmm. on, did we end up doing too much? Was it the wrong medicine or, or not necessarily tailored the right way because the dynamics of the pandemic shutdown and reopenings were just so unlike anything we've ever seen before. Now, you've written up a fascinating analogy to the, to the run-up in prices, which is to the, uh, the Uber Lyft economy, surge pricing. Everybody knows that if it costs $10 to get from your home to work, if you, if you go there on a rainy day, it's going to cost, you know, not $12, it's going to cost $18 or $25 or something. But could, could you tell us uh, how does, in hindsight, as you've, as you've explored these, uh, this last period, how does that apply, the, the surge pricing dynamic to the U.S. economy? So we've been seeing these wildly mixed signals that are really hard to understand from the economy. So for example, businesses across my region, I'm guessing it's true here too, number one complaint is they can't find the workers they need and they're having to pay up a lot. Unemployment, very low. And yet if you look at labor share of income, so the U.S. economy produces so much income, some of it goes to the owners of capital, some of it goes to workers. Labor share of income is going down. Well, how is that? You would think in a tight labor market with a lot of bargaining power, labor share of income would be going up. So is this really a tight labor market or not? And this is where we came up with the surge pricing analogy. So imagine in my analogy that Uber owns all the cars and the drivers of their employees. The rainstorm hits, Uber says to all of their drivers, we'll pay you time and a half, get out and drive. And the price skyrockets by way more than time and a half. So Uber's profits go through the roof. What's going on here? Well, what's going on here is worker incomes are up. All the workers are fully employed. Uh, profits have soared and labor share of income has gone down. But only for as long as it rains. Correct, only for as long as it rains. This dynamic actually kind of describes the economy that we've been experiencing in recent year, in the recent period. And so the hope is that when it stops raining, that prices will very quickly revert back down to what we've been used to. I was just trying to understand and reconcile these various signals that we're seeing. And the surge pricing analogy, at least for me, actually does a pretty good job. It's a simple analogy, but a pretty good job of explaining the situation. Well, it's a cause for hope because the, the rain of... Uh of uh, the supply chain problems is abating and, and, and so on. I mean, that's, if, that's if right. We're not going to be in a, in a rainstorm uh, uh, forever. What, what lessons can you take away 
when I say next, hopefully we'll never deal with another pandemic like this, but we'll deal with something. And it might be the first something of that sort, just as the pandemic was the first of that sort. Are, are there any, you know, every crisis is different. That's why they're crises. But are there any lessons you can take from this for the next time, whenever the next time, and whatever the next time is? I think it's um, have a lot of diverse voices around the table to offer di differing opinions so you can test each other and see if you're missing something. I mean, somebody asked me yesterday uh, why there were a few prominent economists who were very critical of saying, hey, this inflation is not transitory. And they asked me, why didn't you listen to those? And my answer was this, because they couldn't explain how it would work. It was like, this is my judge. Basically, they were saying, this is my judgment based on my experience that this is going to be a big problem. And we would say, okay, explain to us the mechanism. Explain to us how you're going to have very high inflation with 5.9% unemployment. What is the mechanism by which you get from here to there? And so, you know, it, it's, a tough, it's a tough issue because we are constantly being called by experts saying radically different things. Like there are some experts who used to like me when I called for low rates who now think I've abandoned them and that what are you looking at? And they're really mad and they're calling us saying these rate hikes are crazy. You shouldn't be doing this. And then there are other people who are calling and saying, oh my gosh, you're not being nearly aggressive enough. So how do you make decisions? How do you make sense in the noise, the cacophony of loud voices? Uh, it's challenging. And so you have to go back to some fundamental principles to look at the data, to let the data guide you, to use the models and then apply your own judgment. I mean, we need to study this period before I'm going to be able to, I need your help to go you know, back and document it. Serious question. Is the Fed's forecasting ability any better than anybody else's? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, I don't think my forecasting ability so, is better than, what, what, I don't want to- uh, Is there it. a case for just saying to the Fed, let's get out of the forecasting business. Let's not try and anticipate anything because it's the future. We don't know what's going to happen. And when we see the inflation, we'll jack up rates. When we see the unemployment, we'll ease. And let's just admit, um, you know, we're good economists. We're good responders. But we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, there's, I'm sympathetic with that view. We've, we've created a process where every five years, we're going to take a comprehensive look at how we conduct monetary policy and what we can learn from our own experience and other central banks. In a few years, we're going to kick off that process again. And I think that's a very thoughtful question uh, that we should ask. Now, I think this discussion, by inference, has given the Fed too much credit because you're not alone to blame for the inflation. Uh, a lot of people think the deficit, and therefore the Congress and the administrations, the two of them, uh, had a lot to do with it. What do you think about that? Is, is, is um, these record deficits, both you know, in, in the full COVID period and the aftermath, um, how much have they had to do? Uh, uh, with the inflation and how much do the uh, seemingly continuing deficits for, for, for as far as the eye can see uh, uh, worry you? Um, well, I definitely think the fiscal support after, during the pandemic and following the pandemic was part of it. Remember, go back to vaccines. The biggest shock of the COVID pandemic once it started was how quick these, avail these highly effective vaccines came online. So a lot of the pandemic responses were not designed knowing that we would have highly effective vaccines by the end of 2020 and into 2021. And so again, with the benefit of hindsight, were some of these programs oversized? I think probably. And you can look at it. I, I mentioned uh, some of the bank CEOs that we talked to report about the checking account balances of their customers. That somebody who used to have $1,000 in their checking account before the pandemic at the peak had $7,000 in their checking account. I mean, huge multiples because of a lot of the government support. That definitely affected buying behavior, it definitely affected the choices people made about which jobs to go back to when they wanted to come back to work. So it, it definitely had some effect. And I think all of this we should reflect on and learn from it. I do think Congress learned from 08 and they acted very aggressively. Remember in 08, when we went to Congress to ask for the TARP authority, Congress first turned us down. All right, and then the Dow plummeted. And 700 then, points. Correct, yes, and then yes. a few days later they ended up voting for it. And so, um, I think that as a country, we are capable of learning from prior experiences uh, and doing better in the future. You know, if you, if you strip away the, uh, the, the sort of blackmail aspect of what's going on with the debt ceiling now, uh, because obviously the money's already been appropriated, 
So we're going to have to borrow them. We're going to have to borrow to be able to spend the money we've already legislated. But if you strip that aspect out, uh, are the Republicans right to be worried about the deficits? And I, by the way, I should say that that I'm speaking to a former candidate uh, for governor who, who has who has played both sides of the both the political and the uh, uh, and the monetary fence. Um, long term, I mean, I do think deficits do matter, uh, but it's a it's a curious. There's not a clean answer of knowing exactly how much is too much. And you look, know, Japan has more than twice as much debt to GDP as America, and yet they have rock bottom interest rates and very low inflation. And why is that? You know, go ask 10 economists that question, you're going to get 10 curious looks on their faces because nobody can really explain that. And how I thought much they is, matter whenever the other parties involved. Well, that's certainly true. That's certainly true. But that's, you know, that's the tough part. How much is too much? You do know you've many examples in, in world history when a country gets over indebted, people lose confidence, and then all of a sudden they can't pay their bills anymore. So we don't want to push it, right? We want people to maintain confidence in the U.S. economy, in our fiscal situation, in our uh, economic competitiveness. Uh, and where is too, how far is too much? I don't know. But anything we can do to enhance our economic competitiveness uh, will accrue to our long term interests. Mm -hmm. We were talking at uh at uh, lunch about some of the economic problems the country faces outside of the Fed. And one of them, which I think we both have an interest in, is, is immigration. Immigration, particularly in the context uh, of, of the missing worker, but, but perhaps also in the context of the, um, uh, the, the addition of creativity and openness and uh, uh, everything that immigrants br bring. You, you, you two, uh, Exhibits uh, exhibits a, but just uh, for an open society and for productive, growing society, is is um, are missing immigrants part of the story of the missing worker, and and how serious is the labor shortage to you, uh, uh, right now? The missing immigrants are a big part of the current story, but they're a huge part of our future economic competitiveness. Whether we are thoughtful about embracing immigration, as we have in our in American history, or not, uh, you know. Take I mentioned Japan. Japan's demographics are worse than America's. Their society is aging more, even more, uh, and they have having fewer young people. But they're also very closed off to immigration. It's not a tool available to them. This is a tool. We're not perfect at it, but man, we're pretty darn good at it. And this is a tool available to us if we want to economically compete and win and run circles around any of our adversaries, immigration is a tool that we have available to us because so many immigrants from around the world want to come here. And we're talking high-skilled immigrants, we're talking uh, lower-skilled immigrants, folks working on farms or factories or doctors and everything in between. Every business that I meet with across my region, I'm guessing this district is not that different, talks about the need to find workers and it's a structural issue. It's not simply an issue of today it's an issue of the next five years or the next 10 years. And so, and you know, I talked to all of the elected representatives, members of Congress in the Senate from my part of the country, Republican and Democrat, 100% of them understand this. And actually 100% of them agree with the need for immigration to feed our economy. The challenge is when the cameras come on and the politics gets in the way. It's like, you all agree. I say to them, I said, you all agree. You shouldn't be able to do something if you all agree. Will there be another campaign? Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> not for me. Not, not to mention the, uh, the uh, uh, addition that immigrants uh, give to the retirement systems. Absolutely. To, you know, creating much more of a bulge below instead of having uh, just a few younger generation members supporting uh, all of us uh, uh, graybeards, which is insoluble without people. You just, exactly. You, you just uh, uh, can't do it. We have a, a crypto uh, expert at the table, uh, a central bank crypto expert. So... Uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, there's a lot of talk about uh, central bank digital currencies. Uh, is there a problem which these things are supposed to solve? Uh, I'll tell you frankly, in the, uh, in the private sector, I don't see the problem, except, except uh, when they go bust, journalists get to write about them. <laughs> but but um, is, this, is this something that central banks, our central bank, the Federal Reserve, needs? Uh, that's the question I'm asking, which is what problem does this solve, whether it's a central bank digital currency or Bitcoin or any of these other flavors, what actual problem? And I've been asking this question now for several years. 
And to my mind, no one's been able to answer it. Usually I get back, well, there's a problem in America of financial inclusion, and maybe this will be better for financial inclusion. Is there any evidence that it's better for financial inclusion? Well, maybe. That's kind of the quality of the answer I've gotten back so far. So I'm reserving judgment. I want to, I mean, I've, we've got colleagues at the Boston Fed who are studying this, who are working hard. I think that's great to study it and analyze it. But I think we need to explain. So I'll give you an example. I can send $5 right now instantly to anybody in this room with Venmo or PayPal or Zelle or someday FedNow. Okay. So what is it that a CBDC can do that Venmo can't do? So the only, I, the only speculation I've been able to come up with, because everyone says, well, China's doing it. Therefore, we need to do it. Well, you know what you could do with the central bank digital currency that you can't do with Venmo? You could charge negative interest rates. Mm -hmm. Can't do that with Venmo. You could directly tax customer accounts. Can't do that with Venmo. And you could monitor every one of your transactions. Can't do that with Venmo. So I get why the Chinese government is doing it. So you're it. saying in the, in the hands of the government, this is a more intrusive, the, the, um, the ideology of the private crypto world grew up with, hey, you know, we'll be far from government. This will be liberation. Um, we won't have the, you know, the, the heavy hand of the state, the Federal Reserve on our money. But you're saying that in a central bank context, it's the opposite. Well, no, let me say this. None of my colleagues at the Federal Reserve who are interested in this want to do any of the things I just said. Right? That is not what's motivating us. But those are the only use cases I've been able to come up with that you could achieve with the central bank digital currency that you cannot achieve through other means. Can you Venmo money to people <clears throat> over borders? I don't know. But the challenge is like central bank digital currency. So this is like with Bitcoin. They say, oh, Bitcoin's great cross-border transactions. My in-laws live in the Philippines. If I want to send my father-in-law $100 to buy groceries, I set him $100 in Bitcoin. Great. How does he buy groceries? Well, Sam Bankman fried said he wanted to give away the bulk of his money. I think he proved it's a very effective tool for doing that. <laughs> You know, I, I think I'm supposed to break for questions. Well, okay, before. but before we do. Okay, okay. I want to, so I've, I'm kind of a history junkie. And this book that Roger just wrote, Ways and Means, uh, is about how Lincoln financed the Civil War. I read a lot on the Civil War, maybe 15 or 20 books before I read Roger's book. And I, when I heard that he wrote a book on the Civil War, I thought, all due respect, what's left to write? And Roger pulled on this thread and this whole world of the foundation of economic policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy is right there. So I just have to ask you, where did you come up with this idea and the inspiration for writing this book? Because I loved it. I was sad when I finished reading it. Thank you very much. I came up with it uh, uh, right here in a sense. The previous book was a book I wrote about the Fed. Uh, it was a book about the, um, uh, the history of the Fed. And the Fed was formed in 1913. And I learned a little bit in the course of that about the system it replaced, which uh, was the national banking system, which has formed the Civil War uh, by the, the architect of it was Simon Chase, the Treasury Secretary. And I was um, uh, intrigued that with everything else going on in the Civil War, like fighting the Civil War, they had uh, designed this very complicated, but quite effective and, and enduring, uh, 50 years is not bad, uh, financial system. And then when I looked a little more, I saw that that they did all sorts of things in. They created a currency. They created the forerunner of the IRS. They created the first income tax. Uh, we had the first fiat money and the Homestead Act and the railroads and the land grant college. They really created uh, a federal government uh, role in the economy, both financially and economically, uh, you know, in very much sort of a way that FDR had extended uh, the role of the federal government. Because everyone knew about FDR. I had known about it. And the, and the premise was well, people don't really know about this side of, of Lincoln's Civil War. So thank you for asking. Yeah. Well, necessity is mother of invention. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to give endorsements, but thank you. wink, wink, uh, thank ways you. and means thank is you. a heck of a book. Well, so we've got, I guess we've got mics up and uh, hands up. And if you want to ask Roger a question, uh, I won't be offended. Hi, thank you. He's Very got interesting. The, um, the Fed's work could be made easier or more difficult uh, with, because of uh, fiscal policy. Um, can you talk about the Fed's influence or lack of influence on shaping f uh, fiscal policy? And what do you think um, would be helpful to the Fed's mission right now in terms of fiscal policy? Thank well, you. 
Yeah, we, we try to stay out of fiscal policy and the, the, the kind of handshake agreement is then hopefully the elected leaders give us space to do our jobs to achieve our dual mandate subject to their oversight. So we try not to give advice on specific fiscal measures. Uh, you know, there are times when we're in crisis when there can be coordination, but generally speaking, we wanna be left alone and we try to leave Congress alone to do their jobs. I'll give you just one thing right now that's percolating fiscally that is on my mind. A lot of states are flush. So my state, Minnesota, typically has a $50 billion state budget. They're expecting a $17 billion wow. surplus. Wow. Uh, Montana, $7 billion budget, two and a half surplus. Wisconsin, similar, about a 30% surplus in these states. And a lot of them are considering, some of them are considering tax rebates to their families, which I understand, but that's more stimulus. Like it's more money in people's pockets. I want them to have their money back but it also means that people have more money to spend on goods and services or you know, take more time before re-entering the job market. On the margin, it's probably a little bit inflationary and makes our jobs on the margin a little bit harder. And so those are the types of things that we are aware, that I'm aware of. Our colleagues are always analyzing whatever packages Congress puts out to analyze what does it do to the economy. And then we just simply take that as an input into our policy deliberations. Just continuing the question on fiscal versus um, what you guys are working on. If you look at the stimulus that happened and the deficits that grew, they were done under very low interest rates. As the federal government tries to roll that debt, it's somewhat going to be uh, beholden to whether you're successful in inflation. Can you spend a second how you think about um, what you need to target for inflation rates and uh, the, the market interest rates as it relates to the federal government trying to roll this debt? Because... They're going from, I think, sub 2% to if they rolled it now, 4%. Thank you. Well, um, we, don't, we don't think about and talk about what do our interest rate policies mean for the federal government. It's, it's Treasury's job and Congress's job to finance the government. It's our job to meet the dual mandate of stable prices and maximum unemployment. The best thing we can do for the society is get inflation back down to 2%. I, you know, if we were to lose, lose control of inflation expectations, and instead of having expectations at 2%, they were at 4% or 5%, eventually that would then of course express itself in much higher rates for the government to go and borrow at. And so I think our, everybody's interests are aligned. We have to get inflation back down to 2%. Uh, and then that'll, that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because that's our job, but that'll make, uh, on the margin, that would make Treasury's job easier if we keep inflation expectations anchored. Gentleman here, the mic's coming to you, sir. This one. Uh, the gross domestic product was growing at zero percent uh, in the first half of last year, and you guys raised rates from zero to something like four and a half percent over the course of the year, and the real GDP growth rate accelerated to three percent in the second half of the year. Why did that happen? Yeah, I, um, hard to know. This is another example of the mixed signals that we're getting from the economy. Typically, economists will say, well, if you have two quarters in a row of negative GDP growth, that typically signals a recession. But typically in a recession, you have a lot of job losses. And in those first six months of the year, you had very, very strong job growth. That's why many of us said it doesn't look like we're really in a recession. So I don't have a great answer. There were some measurement issues between uh, gross domestic product and gross domestic income. Those two are supposed to be the same. They, they had big deviations during that period. And then they reverted back towards each other over time. Uh, we're expecting as policy is tight, tighter, the economy will grow much more slowly this year over the course of this year than last. Most forecasts I think are for us to avoid a recession, but I think it's gonna depend on some of the dynamics that we've been talking about here today. So I don't have a good answer for you, sir. It's a lot of mixed signals coming out of the economy and the reopening. It's often been uh, pointed out that uh, financial crises are associated with rising, frequently associated with rising rate environments. So I'd be interested in your views on the current state of financial conditions and more specifically the growth of credit outside of the banking system in the what used to be called, I guess, the shadow banking system. 
So we have a team of, actually after the financial crisis, the Board of Governors created a team of economists who are charged to study financial stability risks. And they are, and with colleagues around the system, are constantly surveying different markets, looking for signs of excess. Typically it's excess leverage that gets built up. Then you're in a rate, higher, raise, higher rate environment. They can roll over those debts and that leads to some kind of a downturn. Uh, right now we're not seeing evidence like households, which was a big challenge in the 06, 07, 08 crisis. Households generally speaking have very strong balance sheets. Uh, people have a lot of equity in their homes. Uh, you look a, around a lot of businesses, generally speaking, we are not seeing signs of uh, massive over leverage, which suggests some type of systemic risk. But as Roger said, crises always come from where you're not expecting them. And so could it be that in a continuing increasing rate environment, we see other areas of pressure? It is certainly possible, but right now we're not seeing anything that's jumping out of the traditional things that we look at that says that there's a problem around the corner, but we're watching. Oh, we're, we're, getting, the, we're getting the signal that uh, we're, at our, we're at our time. So, Roger, I'll leave you. Any last thoughts I just, or questions? Uh, if you're a betting man, are we going to have a recession or not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to answer a different question. Uh, <laughs> I'm a betting man in the sense that I bet that the Federal Reserve is going to get inflation back down to 2%. Okay. We're committed to it. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. This is really fun. It's really fun.